Hey, good morning, Crossroads. So glad that you are joining us this morning from wherever in the world you're watching from. My name is Ed Applegate. I'm one of the pastors here. And thank you for welcoming us into your home, your workplace, your car, your social distance coffee shop, wherever you are. Hey, before I jump into the message this morning, I, I haven't had a chance to speak since the coronavirus kind of turned the whole world upside down. And I just wanted to say a few things about just how awesome a church you have been during this time. You know, we have been meeting needs, we've been supporting first responders, we've been hosting blood drives, meeting in groups online, we've been doing all sorts of things. I'm so proud of our tag teams and Celebrate Recovery and in Next Gen Ministries, how they've pivoted and, and done ministries in all sorts of creative ways. And I'm just so thankful to God to be part of this church and so proud of you guys as a church. I just want to say, as one of your pastors, well done. And thank you for your generosity in supporting the mission of the church. You know, if you'd like to give uh, to Crossroads this morning and to our mission to lead people to discover Jesus and follow him fully, there's three ways you can do that. You can give online through the app or the website, crossroadsgrace.org slash give. You can text to give to 797979, or you can even use the snail mail and PO box, send your checks to P.O. Box 1200, Manteca, California. And I just want to thank you for your generosity in supporting the mission of Crossroads. You know, I, I've got a question for you. Have you ever climbed a mountain? There's probably quite a few of you who have climbed a mountain, but, but have you ever climbed two mountains in one day? I have. I have, and let me tell you about it. See, I am not a mountain climber. I don't have any special need to climb mountains. In fact, I like to look at mountains rather than climb them. But when I used to live in England, I had a good friend named Edmund who was an avid hiker, and he was always bugging me to get up a mountain with him. And one day, he finally persuaded me to climb a mountain in North England. And uh, so we set out on our hike early one morning, uh, and you know what? We make really good progress. We actually got to the top of the mountain by lunchtime and we're sitting on the top, we're eating our lunch. And then all of a sudden, Edmund gets this kind of perplexed look on his face. He starts, starts humming and on in his Northern English accent and he pulls out the map. Yeah, I'm old enough to remember those pre-GPS days. And he's looking at the map and suddenly he says, we are on the jolly wrong mountain. The one next door is the one we're supposed to be on. That's the highest peak. And I'm like, oh, oh, that's, that's cool. Well, we got a really good view of it from right here. But Edmund, he's not one satisfied to go home settling at being on the second highest peak. No, he wanted to be at the top of the highest peak. And so that was the day we climbed two mountains. Now, if you've ever climbed a mountain, you know what it's like sitting at the top. There's so many thoughts and experiences. You're exhausted from the climb, you're relieved to get to the top, and you're exhilarated at the beautiful, all-encompassing view. You feel completely alive in that moment. And it's fascinating when you think about it, because that's a moment when your tininess and your insignificance might be the most obvious. And yet in that exact moment is when we feel most alive and full of awe. You know, I think there's a reason for that. We're in week two of our series, Greater. We're looking at the life of John the Baptist, who was given the assignment of preparing the people for the arrival of Jesus. Last week, we heard that the coming of Jesus had been prophesied about for hundreds of years, and now it had arrived. God had given John the Baptist the job of announcing Jesus' arrival. Now, if you have your Bible here this morning, go ahead and open up to Luke 1, or you can check out our app, or our chat host will post a link uh, where you can learn. Uh, this is Luke chapter 1, where we learn the story of John the Baptist. Now, Luke wrote the book of Luke. He was a doctor, and he was... Uh, uh, get, he went about gathering stories about Jesus' uh, ministry and life from eyewitnesses. And he even names his eyewitnesses in his book so that his contemporary readers could go and talk to those eyewitnesses to find out, was Luke really telling the truth? 
And that's really cool. But today we pick up the story in Luke chapter 1, where Mary, who's pregnant with Jesus, is traveling to visit her cousin Elizabeth, who's pregnant with John. And we pick it up in verse 39. At that time, Mary got ready and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judea, where she entered Zechariah's home and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth had heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. In a loud voice, she exclaimed, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child you will bear. But why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. This is quite a scene going on here. You got two pregnant ladies hugging and laughing, touching each other's bellies, whatever pregnant ladies do when they get together and they're all excited. But here's what's so awesome. As those moms are having their connection, the babies in the wombs are having a connection too. Baby John can't contain himself but leaps for joy in the presence of Jesus. He's not even born yet, but get this. That is how amazing Jesus is. John is dancing a joyful jig in his presence. He doesn't have a guitar. He doesn't have air to breathe. But he is worshiping Jesus as if it's the most natural thing in the world. And that's because it is. You see, we are wired for worship. We are wired for worship. The truth is that even from the youngest age, we have this natural inclination to worship. Check out these two kids praising God. I love that. You know what? If you are a kid watching here today, one, I'm so glad that you're watching. And two, I want you to know you teach us so much about worship. You get it. Jesus is awesome to you and you love to dance and leap and shout and sing about it. And that does wonders for our grown-ups hearts. Our gr we, it reminds us of what really matters. So keep worshiping. Never lose that. You know, me, I cannot sing. I love to sing. I just can't really hold a tune. Uh, but I remember a time when I was maybe eight years old. One evening, my parents had a Bible study at the house. And I was in my room laying on my bed with my Sony Walkman, which was this ancient device that you put tapes in and you rewound and fast forwarded your favorite song. And anyways, uh, you'll... Look about it in the encyclopedias or something. But we're, I was listening to this worship music, and I just started singing along. Didn't think of anything of it. I was singing loud enough, I guess, because before I knew it, my mom was disturbing my beautiful sonata, saying everybody in the house 
could hear exactly what I was singing. Yeah, I guess I, that was, I was loud, and I was super embarrassed. But still, I love to sing to Jesus. Because this, we are wired to worship. It's part of our design. And in this part of the story of John the Baptist, we see his whole family is a family of worshipers. We'll see tonight that we are wired to worship with our voices. We're wired to worship with all our lives. But we also are wired to wor choose who we worship. It's not necessarily that we always worship God. So let's talk about worship today. Firstly, we're wired to worship with our voices. You know, if you're new to church, you may wonder, what's up with all this singing? You may wonder, you know, are we supposed to join in? Are we supposed to listen? Am I supposed to raise my hands? You know, you might be voice challenged like me and wonder, you know, do I really want to put other people through that every week? You know, singing, though, I want you to hear this tonight. Singing is vital to what we do as a church. And I think it's really important for us as Christians to sing. And I want to give you five reasons why we sing. First of all, we sing because God sings. Yeah, that's right. God sings. In Zephaniah 3, 17, it says, The Lord is with you. Uh, the Lord God is with you. You're the mighty warrior who saves. He will take great delight in you. In his love, he will no longer rebuke you, but will rejoice over you with singing. God loves to sing. He loves to sing over us. And he made us in his image to sing to. We sing because God sings. But we sing as a church, too, because God is so awesome. God is so awesome. Psalm 98, 1 says this. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. There's always new songs to sing about God because he is awesome. And he's just too much to ever stop singing and writing new songs about. In Luke 1, right after John's leap, Mary, Jesus' mom... And John's first cousin, once removed, or something like that, she breaks out in song at the greatness of God, which is so amazing. Check this out in Luke chapter 1, verse 46. Mary says, My soul glorifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior, for he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant, and he has performed mighty deeds with his arm. Mary just explodes in song at the joy of the Lord. He is so amazing. And it's the most natural thing in the world to her to exclaim that. See, we sing because God is awesome. Thirdly, we sing because it helps us remember the truth. You know, singing makes things stick in your head, which is not always a great thing. Parents, you know exactly what I mean. I mean, how many times have I find myself walking around the house singing, let it go, let it go, don't want to sing this song anymore. Why am I singing it still? I don't know. I can't get it out of my head and I'm driving myself insane. Songs stick in our head. In Colossians 3, uh, 16, Paul, Paul writes this. He says, let the words of Christ in all their richness live in your hearts and make you wise. Sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs to God with thankful hearts. Let the word of Christ live in your hearts, he's saying. Sing psalms and hymns. He's saying songs with God's truth in it, truth that will set us free, truth that will give us perspective when everything seems upside down. That is why we sing, to remind ourselves of the truth. And that truth leads to the fourth reason. We sing because it gives us strength. You know, when I was in high school, we used to go do choir performances at Camp Pendleton Marine Base in Southern California. And I got the, this incredible privilege to watch hundreds of Marines stand to their feet and sing their Marine hymn. And they sung it loud with pride. From the halls of Montezuma to the shores of Tripoli, we fight our country's battle in the air, on land, and sea. 
First to fight for right and freedom and to keep our honor clean. We are proud to claim the title of United States Marines. Hoorah! And the place would just explode with sound. And I tell you what, in that moment, you get the feeling there is nothing going to stop those Marines from tackling anything. It's incredible. And that's what songs can do. Songs bring strength. And how much more strength does singing truth about our great God bring strength? Nehemiah 8.10 says, The joy of the Lord is your strength. See, when we worship in song, it stiffens our spines. It gives us the strength to persevere. It strengthens our resolve. You know, when my dad was in his last days of his life in, in hospice, my mom spent hours singing to him, song after song, going through a songbook. And she was in that, not only preparing my dad's heart for Jesus, but I think through that she was also singing the truth, strengthening and comforting her own soul in her grief. You see, singing gives us strength in the storms of life. And the awesome thing is, just like Melanie was talking about earlier, when we sing, it causes God's enemies to flee. It causes God's enemies to flee. See, we're not in a fight against flesh and blood in this world. We're in a battle against the spiritual realm. And again and again in Scripture, we find that singing the truth causes God's enemies to flee and us to win the spiritual battle. You see, singing is a serious business. So when we gather, whether it's online or in person, or whether you're alone in your home, enter into singing. Give it your heart, your soul, your mind, your strength. It's a serious business. We're wired to worship with our voices. But worship is far more than just singing. You see, we are wired to worship with our entire lives. Jesus said we are to love God with our heart, our soul, our mind, and our strength. In other words, with everything we do and everything we are, we're to love, we're to worship God. Romans 12.1 says this, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. You see, worship is about offering our bodies as a living sacrifice. Now that might sound really weird to you. I mean, what are we supposed to do? Like go on an altar and kind of live and die or something like that? I don't know. You see, but God is calling us to be a living sacrifice. And this is what he means by that. In the Old Testament times, the people brought sacrifices of animals to God to show him how much they valued God. They said, God, we worship you. We give you worth. This, this is what you mean to us in our life. And Paul says uh, that under Jesus, we don't, we don't do those kind of sacrifices anymore. But actually what we do is we bring ourselves. We're living sacrifices. We make our whole lives about living for God, offering up ourselves, saying, Lord, everything we say, everything we do, you are worth this much to me. And we worship him when we do things that what's right, even when everyone else is going the other way. We say, Lord, you mean this much to me. We trust God with our finances and give back to him in gratefulness and obedience, saying, Lord, you mean this much to me. You know, we worship God when we come to our senses and stop supporting the Dodgers anymore. Oh, no, that's okay. Okay, but no, we worship when we follow God's commands and, and say, Lord, you mean this much to me, even in the little things. You know, in the story of John the Baptist, Elizabeth, John's mom, worshipped in following God's command. It tells us here in Luke 1, in verses 59 and 60, when everyone else wanted to name her baby Zechariah after her, uh, his dad, look, Look what she says. On the eighth day, they came to the circumcise the child, and they were going to name him after his father, Zechariah. But his mother spoke up and said, No, 
he is to be called John. See, God had told her earlier that he was to be called John. And Elizabeth was not going to have anything else other than what God wanted. She was adamant. And that was worship. It might seem like a little thing, but it was a big deal to God. And so it was a big deal to Elizabeth. You see, worship is about everything we do. Living our lives in gratefulness to the glory of God. And here's the crazy thing, though. Even though we're wired to worship, even though God is so amazing, we choose to worship other things. That's, the heart, that's at the heart of what is wrong with humanity. You see, we're wired to worship, but who or what we worship is up to us. We're a world of worshipers, but we've decided to worship all sorts of substitutes for the true and living God. Paul describes our condition in his letter to the Romans. In chapter 1, he says this, verse 25, They exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshipped and served created things rather than the Creator, who is forever praised. Amen. You see, instead of giving worth to Jesus above all things, we've done a terrible exchange. And not only in that are we not giving God the glory he is due. I mean, imagine the goal, right? Substituting anything for God. But not only are we doing that, we, we're going against our design. God isn't meant to be substituted in our life. I mean, imagine for a moment subbing out LeBron James for all five foot eleven lightweight me. I mean, that's a definite loss right there on the scoreboard. Imagine subbing out sugar for salt in that cake recipe. That chocolate cake might look good, but it's going to taste disgusting. It's the same with God. When we sub out worshiping God with our lives, life ends up being a loss. might look like a cake, but it just doesn't taste like it. But we so easily do this. We end up worshiping all sorts of people and places and things, and we dis disregard what God says and all sorts of ways. Around here we talk about the pyramid of priorities. That It starts the way we put God first, spouse second, kids third, and then everything else, job, all that kind of stuff. It's about putting God first. That's about worshiping Him. And whenever we put something above God in that, we're worshiping that thing over God. And it's insanity. This exchange we're making, not only are we putting such a heavy burden on our spouse, our kids, our jobs, or whatever, to live up to who God is, but we're selling ourselves so short. C.S. Lewis wrote about this when he said this. He said, we are half-hearted creatures fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered us. Like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea. We are far too easily pleased. You see, infinite joy is offered us in worshiping the true and living God and knowing him. And yet we are pleased with mud pies in the backyard. We can know and worship the true and living God, but we've subbed him out. We're on the jolly wrong mountain. So let's go down and let's climb the highest peak and enjoy the best thing in the entire world, the Lord himself. And when we do that, when we do that, it delights our hearts. It stiffens our spine. It opens our eyes to wonders we could never imagine and it's how, because it's how we're designed. You see, I, we should want everybody to worship God because of that, because of it's in our design. You know what's amazing? is seeing people who don't know Jesus come to know him. I remember the day at church, specifically in my head, it's a memory of my friend Ollie who a year earlier had in introduced himself as an atheist. He came to Christ, and that day I remember he raised his hands in worshiping Jesus, and it was such a thrill to see that, to see his hands delighting in Jesus. 
John Piper says, mission exists because worship doesn't. That's our goal. In reaching people, that's our goal. But to, that they would worship Jesus. That they would find the delight of our, their hearts in Jesus. We want them to taste and see how good God is. You know, parents, when it comes to raising our kids, the most important thing we can give them is an awe of God that they capture how amazing He is and come to worship Him fully. Paul Tripp wrote this. He said, the greatest, the great battle of parenting is not the battle of behavior. Many of us think it is, and it's easy to get stuck in that trap. I know I do. It's not that battle. The battle is for the kind of awe that will rule our kids' hearts, our children's hearts. You know, moms, uh, dads, we've got to do this well. But let me talk to you dads for a minute. See, your kids look up to you, especially when they're young, in huge ways. You basically walk on water sometimes, dads, and it's, it's a huge opportunity. And it's an opportunity, as they look up to you, to show your kids not, not your pride in your own abilities, but your awe, your wonder, your worship, your obedience of your Father in heaven. To show them that example. When you're out in nature, when you're doing things together, we just bring up God and how amazing he is. When they get a, a cut on their arm and they, and, they, and they watch it heal, say, wow, isn't it amazing how God has healed, it's designed our bodies to heal. Or you're looking up at the stars, Give your kids an awe of how amazing God is. And I tell you what, if that's the kind of awe they have in their hearts, that will guide them for years to come. This brings us really full circle in the story of John the Baptist. You might remember last week, John's dad, Zechariah, didn't believe God's promise. You see, he, God had told him and Elizabeth that even though they were both enjoying senior discount at Denny's, they were going to have a baby. And, be, and because he didn't believe God's promise, the angel made him mute. And so for 10 months, he was not able to speak. And that's a long time to listen and think and realize what you had done wrong. And Zechariah is repentant. It tells us that right here, um, in Luke chapter 1, uh, I love what happens as John is born and they get ready to name him. It says this in verse 62, they made signs to his father to find out what he would like to name the child. He asked for a writing tablet because he still couldn't speak at this point. And he said, and to everyone's astonishment, he wrote, his name is John. Immediately his mouth was open and his tongue set free and he began to speak. Praising God. Praising God. That moment, his tongue is released. What does he have to say? Words of praise to God. He's no longer disbelieving. He's repentant for what, uh, for doubting God. And he's full of praise now. And that's the kind of dad that's going to raise a John to be a worshiper of Jesus and the perfect person to introduce Jesus to the entire world. God is amazing. And maybe you're realizing that you have subbed him out. It's time to put him above whoever or whatever we've been putting above him. It's time to worship him above all things. You know, you, today you might be leaping like, you need, might need to leap like John, even at a young age. It might be that you need to sing like Mary. It might be you need to obey even in the little things like Elizabeth. Or it might be like Zechariah. You're come to your senses, realizing God is who he says he is. And he has done amazing things. And it's time to speak words of praise of God to those around you. Let's learn from this family of worshipers. You see, we're wired to worship. We're wired to worship with our voices, we're wired to worship with our lives, but it's up to us who or what we will worship. So this morning, we're going to move into a time of communion, and we're going to remember what Jesus did for us. This is 
an act of worship in itself as we come before him and remember him and thank him for what he did uh, redeeming us through his death on the cross and this is a time to to take different postures in your worship this morning maybe you want to raise your hand in thankfulness and gratefulness maybe it's a time to just bow and pray as you listen to this song maybe it's a chance to sing Maybe it's a time to confess and say, Lord, I haven't put you first in my life or this week I haven't put you first and to say sorry and to thank him and worship him for his grace and his mercy. So it's a good time to get your communion elements ready if you don't have them. And let's, let's do business with God in these moments. All believers are welcome to communion with us. So this morning we take the cracker, the bread, to remember Jesus' body, which was given for us. So let's take and eat and remember him. And we take the juice and we remember and worship and thank him for his blood that was spilt for the forgiveness of our sins. Let's take and drink. Father, thank you so much for your grace and your mercy that even when we had subbed you out, you pursued us, you came after us, and Lord, you forgave us, you sent your Son to die in our place so that we could be with you and know you and have the joy of worshiping you forever. We worship and we praise you. Guide us as we go into this week. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.